Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID-19 debunking video. So this week is going to be pretty fun. A few months ago, I made a video addressing the claims of prominent COVID anti-vaxxer Kurt van den Busche. He's a scientist who thinks that mass COVID-19 vaccination is going to lead to mass disaster. And he's been spreading this message on some of the most anti-vaccine platforms out there. Now, in my video, I addressed a lot of his claims point by point, and even invited him to come chat with me live. I emailed him and everything. But instead of emailing me back, he decided to write a blog post about me. Judging from this blog post, he didn't seem to be too happy with me, but he still didn't respond to my email. So here we are, going through his blog post, debunking that point by point. So right away, I guess I should address the title, When a Breakdancer Teaches About COVID-19. This is just weird. I'm not a breakdancer. I'm a scientist by profession. I used to breakdance when I was younger as a hobby, but in order for Kurt to know this, he would have probably had to find some of my personal social media accounts and then search way back to find some of my old posts. And instead of ever even mentioning that I have a PhD, he decides to fixate on this part of my past that I think is pretty cool. And the whole thing is just weird. If he was going through all of that trouble to look at my social media history, and figure out little details about me, why doesn't he just talk to me? Oh well, let's go to the science. So right away he goes straight to doubling down on his claims that vaccinated people are breeding grounds for immune escape variants of SARS-CoV-2, while unvaccinated people or people who have natural immunity to SARS-CoV-2 somehow are not. These concepts here are ones that any molecular biologist or evolutionary biologist will agree with. In order for a virus to mutate sufficiently to escape an immune system, it needs two things. It needs a lot of time, and it needs to be able to replicate a lot. Vaccines will reduce both of these factors. A vaccinated person who is able to mount a quick immune response in response to a SARS-CoV-2 infection will be able to clear the virus much faster than an unvaccinated person. This means that the virus will have less time to replicate and will not be able to build up as many mutations as it would in an unvaccinated person. This, of course, will be a factor in the virus's evolution, but this also applies to natural immunity. So allowing the virus to spread will still mean that it will be challenged by an immune system. It will still have selective pressures acting on it. We do have plenty of data to show that vaccinated people clear the virus faster than unvaccinated people, transmit it less, and there is no data to suggest that vaccinated people are selectively shedding variants. So a quick summary of this point would be that variants, including immune escape variants, are going to happen with or without vaccines. It's just a matter of choosing whether or not we want to protect ourselves from disease and slow the viral evolution while that happens. But keep in mind that a variant that can completely escape an immune system is probably not going to happen for a very long time, if ever. The reason for this is because our immunity to SARS-CoV-2 is really robust. We have B cells and T cells capable of identifying and neutralizing a wide variety of SARS-CoV-2 variants. Immunity granted to us by vaccines, for example, was able to be durable against Delta variant and probably against Omicron variant as well. But more on that later. So in this paragraph, I have to address one of the most egregiously wrong things that he will ever say in anything he talks about. He says that unvaccinated people are not a breeding ground for SARS-CoV-2 because they can eliminate all coronaviruses. I mean, I almost just don't know where to start with this. It is so bad. If unvaccinated people can clear all coronaviruses, then why are the unvaccinated the ones who are getting hospitalized and dying at rates that far, far exceed that of vaccinated people? Why, if unvaccinated people can clear all coronaviruses, did SARS-CoV-2 ravage the globe in 2020, causing mass excess deaths before we had any vaccines? Why do other SARS coronaviruses, such as SARS-1 and MERS, have death rates in the range of 10 and 30 percent? If Hurt was right, then none of this would be true. It's just that simple. But what makes him say this? Does he have any evidence that unvaccinated people can clear the virus just that easily? Well, in other posts that he's made, he's made it clear that he's talking about IgM antibodies here. These so-called natural antibodies clearing a viral infection is just not a thing. That doesn't happen. So here's a quick immunology lesson so we can go through this. Your B cells have a really fascinating mechanism to create a wide array of antibodies. And when I say a wide array, I mean a number that's so big it's hard to imagine. 
This mechanism is called VDJ recombination. It's a way for B cells to shuffle around their genes that they use to make antibodies so that they can basically recombine and miss and match these genes in ways that create a lot of different combinations of antibodies. So in theory, we have IgM antibodies that are capable of binding to any conceivable epitope from any conceivable pathogen. However, these antibodies are not very good. They usually will not bind their target really tightly, and they are usually in really, really low numbers. And the great thing is there's data to support all of this. There's a really fantastic study that encapsulates all of these immunological concepts and demonstrates that we do have antibodies that can weakly bind SARS-CoV-2, even in individuals who have never seen SARS-CoV-2. However, we also have data showing that these IgM antibodies are not very good at actually neutralizing SARS-CoV-2. The reason for this is that when these weakly binding antibodies do find their target, it will cause their corresponding B cell to essentially go to school. The B cell will migrate to a place we call the germinal center, where it will undergo something called hypersomatic mutation. This process will make the antibody much, much better. The papers I'm linking in the description go through all the nitty gritty details, but without going over all that in this video, all you need to know is that at the end of this hypersomatic mutation process in these germinal centers, you end up with really potent antibodies. It is these antibodies that will help your immune system clear SARS-CoV-2 not the natural antibodies that Hurt thinks are somehow a panacea against all coronaviruses, even though coronaviruses cause disease in humans. It just, it's wild. But this is the problem with practically everything that Hurt says. There's just no evidence for it. He's practically making it up. Most of the rest of this blog post is just him calling me names and generally being a really angry, unpleasant person. So that's a real shame because Hurt, I wanted to talk to you. I still do. But anyway, he does say one more thing that I want to talk about. In my last video, I brought up the fact that when you have immunity to SARS-CoV-2 granted by a vaccine, you also develop T-cell immunity. T-cells are able to recognize target antigens by using what we call the major histocompatibility complex, or MHC. There's a ton of immunology to go through, but I'll focus only on what's relevant here. These MHC proteins are coded for by the human leukocyte antigen genes, or HLA genes. These genes are going to be different from person to person. Because they're different from person to person, they're going to be able to recognize slightly different conformations of peptides, which act as the epitopes. What this means is that T-cells will be able to recognize many, many different sites on a spike protein, for example, and the sites that it recognizes are not going to be the same from one person to the next. So even if SARS-CoV-2 were able to evolve some of its T-cell epitopes to escape my T-cells, it's probably not going to be able to escape the next person's T-cells. This makes T-cells a really highly potent tool in your immune system's arsenal, and it creates a really high genetic barrier for SARS-CoV-2 to get over in order to actually escape your immune system. We see this today with Omicron, for example. Although it is able to escape a lot of the antibodies that we previously had that were able to neutralize SARS-CoV-2, Omicron still retains about 80% of the T-cell epitopes. This means that our T cells are still going to be able to recognize Omicron. And side note, thanks to hypersomatic mutation in B cells that I previously talked about, we're going to be able to create better and more robust antibodies specifically against Omicron if we encounter it. So in the example of Omicron or another highly mutated variant, our T cells would likely be able to hold the virus back and prevent it from causing severe disease in us long enough for our B cells to respond and produce new, better antibodies specifically geared towards it. So at the end of the day, Hertz doom and gloom scaremongering scenario of vaccines somehow creating a new scary variant of SARS-CoV-2 that we all have to worry about, even though unvaccinated people can clear all coronaviruses, we're just going to leave that. Anyway, it's totally false. Vaccines are undoubtedly our best tool against this pandemic. There is no question about that. Oh, and one final side note, despite everything that Hurt says about how unvaccinated people have nothing to worry about with coronavirus, and these vaccines are so flawed, he himself claims to be working on his own COVID vaccine. Yeah, that's right. I won't go into the proposed concept of his vaccine that doesn't exist yet, because it's pretty ridiculous and definitely won't work. I just think it's kind of funny to point out that he is scaremongering about current vaccines in order to promote a future product that he hopes to create. That is what you call grifting. 
So because Hurt really likes to call me names, I'm going to come up with my own name for him. I'm just going to call him Grift Vandenbosch. So Grift, my offer still stands. If you want to talk live and hash this out, then just respond to my email. We can set something up. Well, that certainly was a fun one, and this, I think, will conclude the saga of Grift Van and Bosch on my channel, because I highly doubt that he'll ever respond to me. A big thank you to immunologist Mark Veldhone, who helped me organize my thoughts and find sources for this video. Huge thanks to him. And thank you all for watching. All of the research and more that I talk about in this video is linked in the description for yourself, so that you can read it and learn about immunology, because it is really fascinating. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this one. I sure did. And if you want to see more of me, then don't forget to subscribe so that you'll catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.